So good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Catherine Bliss and I am a Deputy Director in the Global Health Policy Center here. And it is a pleasure to see so many people here today for the second in our debate series, Fault Lines in Global Health. Now the CSIS Global Health Policy Center inaugurated the Fault Lines series over the summer in order to foster constructive debate and sharing of perspectives on some of today's key global health challenges. We held our first session on August 6th when we hosted a lively debate over the sustainability of the United States bilateral HIV AIDS programs. The enthusiastic participation at the event, in person and online, convinced us that there is considerable appetite for honest dialogue regarding differences of opinion on the most pressing international health concerns. Now this afternoon, we host a discussion on the nature and future of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. We will hear expert opinion, and perhaps a bit of good-natured sparring, from those who have been on the front lines of global health policy and practice, and who, through their engagement with the fund, have developed diverse per perspectives on how it might be best organized to meet future global health challenges. We are fortunate to count on Susan Denser, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, as our moderator for this session. And I understand Ms. Denser is, is on her way as we speak. Um, I want to thank Susan in advance for her commitment of time and skill to the task of moderating this series. Now in just a minute, I will introduce our speakers and we'll get this debate underway. But before I do, let me make two announcements. First. This month, CSIS is organizing a series of discussions focused on the upcoming Millennium Development Goal Summit at the United Nations in New York. This coming Thursday, so two days from now, on the 16th, we will host conversations regarding Goal 1, to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, Goal 6, to combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, and Goal 7, to ensure environmental sustainability, particularly the target to reduce by half the proportion of people without sustainable access to improved water supply and sanitation. Awesome. And you are all invited to attend. And second, I'd like to announce that our next Fault Lines in Global Health debate will take place in November. Just leave these things with so you. for details about the MDG series and also the next Fault Lines debate, please check with our <coughs> website, www.smartglobalhealth.org. Uh, let me now turn the discussion and debate over to Susan Denson. Please join me in welcoming all of our Thanks so much. <laughs> what, what have you done? I just did a good idea. Yes. Up there as well. No. Oh, okay, great. Good morning. Hi. Good to see you both. How are you? Good afternoon and welcome. We are very delighted here to have this <coughs> second in the series of fault lines in global health debates. Uh, many of you were here in August when Princeton Lyman and Todd Summers and Steve Morrison discussed the sustainability of US bilateral AIDS commitments. And for those who missed it, again, let me repeat that the video is available at www.smartglobalhealth.org slash fault lines. I know you've instantly committed that to memory. Uh, that event really exemplified what we are trying to do with these, this uh, series. We declared that the winner of that debate was not uh, Princeton Lyman, not Steve, uh, not Todd, but rather reasoned, open, civil discourse about important events. And that's our goal for this discussion as well. We know that uh, as distinct from uh, the sort of crossfire mode of people screaming at each other and uh, making superficial statements. We have exactly the opposite temperament of people here today. We have people who really understand, as do all of you, uh, the grays as opposed to the blacks and whites of these issues. And so what we're really attempting to do is have a very uh, powerful and important discussion that is, as I say, civil, uh, that gets us to some greater understanding of some of the issues at stake. Just to give you uh, a brief description, as you know, the topic today, uh, we're debating the resolution that the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria should be transformed to become 
not the global fund for those three conditions, but rather the global fund overall for health. Mark Dibel, whom I'll introduce in a moment, is going to argue in favor of the resolution. Julian here will respond. We're going to start with their opening statements, followed by some questions from me and you. And then all three of us will offer some closing thoughts. Uh, my own thoughts on this topic are virtually irrelevant, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. I will simply say, as a person who's watched global health for quite some time, we've all lived through the debates over vertical programs, and we've heard uh, the discussions about, of course, the big successes of the vertical programs. And in fact, I think as Mark will go on to say, and as he said in his important article on this topic, it's only in part because we've had so much success with programs like PEPFAR and others that we began to recognize the limits of those programs and understand why we need horizontal programs. Uh, in other words, uh, efforts across the board to shore up healthcare systems uh, and uh, attack an uh, entire array of preconditions for disease and illness as opposed to just tackling those illnesses on a one-by-one -one basis. Uh, then, of course, we've all lived through the discussion and the declaration, the sort of detente that says, OK, forget, vertic forget horizontal, forget, or forget vertical, rather, forget horizontal, let's go with diagonal. And those of us who are a little, who found it difficult getting through geometry class at that point say, wait a minute, enough. What are we really talking about here? Well, what we're really talking about, of course, is the central issue, which is how, with some pool of resources that is obviously not growing as fast as many of us would like, we make the, the greatest possible improvements in global health with the greatest efficiencies, saving the most lives, uh, really expending our resources as wisely as possible. And where, how do we direct, how do we organize the systems, whether on the delivery level, whether on the financing level, et cetera, that will get us to that goal? That really is the fundamental question, no matter what the geometry is. And that's, of course, what we'll be talking about today is, in fact, shifting the focus of the Global Fund the way to go or one of the ways to go. So let me introduce our uh, speakers. Of, as I mentioned, Mark is going to argue in favor of the resolution. He, Ambassador Mark Dibel, uh, co-directs the Global Health Law Program now at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown, where he's also a distinguished visiting scholar. He's also Global Health Fellow at the George W. Bush Institute and Senior Counselor for the Global Business Coalition on HIV, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. As all of you will know, he served as the US Global AIDS Coordinator from 2006 to the end of the Bush administration and led the implementation of PEPFAR over that period. He also served as chair of the Joint UN Program on AIDS Coordinating Board and was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He got his AB in philosophy and his MD from Georgetown before he did his residency in internal medicine at the University of Chicago Hospitals and also a fellowship in infectious diseases from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So we're delighted to have Mark with us arguing for the resolution. Arguing against it, uh, but I should say also posing some additional ideas of his own, will be Julian Schweitzer. We're very pleased to announce that Julian will join the Results for Development Institute in September. That's now. You're there. You're there. OK. <laughs> All right. So not, not first with the news. We will announce that he is here uh, at the Institute. His work at the Institute uh, is going to include initiatives relating to promoting progress toward universal health coverage, reducing maternal mortality, using innovative technologies for achieving good health at low cost, improving the international health aid architecture, architecture witness today's discussion, et cetera. He comes to all of this after a very distinguished career spanning international development, policy, operational work in many parts of the world, Asia, Latin America, Russia, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. He held a variety of leadership positions at the World Bank, including Director for Human Development in the South Asia region. He's lived for 10 years in Asia and Russia over the course of his career with the bank and has worked in more than 20 low and middle income countries. He has his PhD in natural sciences from the University of London, began his career as an industrial research scientist before becoming very interested in development and shifting over to the field uh, that he's now uh, made such a distinguished mark in, to end the sentence with a preposition. <laughs> OK, anyway. 
We are going to open now with Mark arguing in favor of the resolution. And once again, it is resolved that the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria should be transformed to become the Global Fund for Health. Mark, thanks, um, uh, And thanks to CSIS for inviting me. And it's great to be on stage with Julian. I have to have a caveat. I have a really bad cold. Um, which puts me at a distinct disadvantage because I'm not normally coherent, and I'm even less coherent. Julian could run circles around me even if I were healthy, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, I actually think the overriding question and the starting point should be what, what do we want global health architecture to look like? Not start with what does it look like. Let's start with what we want it to look like and see if we can have a vision and achieve that division. And to do that, I think we need to kind of look at the arc of development and global health, where we've come from, where we are today, and where we want to go. So just starting the latter part of the 20th century, development and global health were largely driven by the Cold War and post-colonial guilt. Sadly, that's where most development came from. As we moved into the 21st century, we saw nothing short of a revolution, a philosophical revolution in terms of what development was about, and that was really enshrined in the Monterey Consensus, the Paris Declaration, and the Accra Accord. And if you distill those down, a couple of key principles, philosophical foundations were there. The most important was country ownership, that we had to move away from the paternalistic approach of post-colonial guilt and the Cold War to full country ownership. And that in order to achieve country ownership, we needed good governance, a results-based approach, all sectors being engaged, that it's not just about public sectors, but all sectors need to be involved. And beneath that, which we're not going to talk that much about, that economic growth is the ultimate engine of development, that everything we do in global health and other areas are in many senses a band-aid. That was revolutionary, revolutionary from where we were in development. And then we had the Millennium Development Goals, which set a framework for development, which included health. The important thing is that we didn't just have a philosophical change. There are a lot of philosophical changes that just sit on shelves. We actually had a massive increase in resources. And most of that was for health. And in many ways, the first decade of the 21st century was the decade of global health. A radical change in taking those principles, those philosophies, and trying to apply them, including with the creation of new institutions. Most of that money was dedicated to disease-specific programs. And they've done a great deal of good. And I don't think we need to go into the many millions of people who are alive today because of disease-specific programs. Many, many tens of millions who will not have disease because of disease-specific programs. So they've done extraordinary good. They've also, in many ways, restored faith in development by setting large dollar amounts for goals and achieving them we moved from a sense of development, which was just a bunch of money floating around with nothing to show for it, to a real belief that you could dedicate large amounts of money, set targets, and achieve results. And in many ways, the new mantra of results-based development is a direct derivative of disease-specific programs. So as such, disease-specific programs were an essential step in the evolution of development. It's an essential movement in the arc of development. And in many ways, it was an evolutionary jump. It wasn't just a slow evolution. It was a radical change. And I believe we could not have done integrated programming 10 years ago. There would not have been the support for it. But disease-specific programs have also re revealed fault lines in global health and, in fact, in development. In today's jargon, they taught us some lessons. There are a lot of lessons learned. One is that we have very weak delivery systems. As people were pushing radically expanded health programs for HIV or malaria or um, neglected tropical diseases, we found that the systems were not strong enough to support them in a very, in a very obvious way. The second piece, perhaps one of the most important pieces, which we all always knew, is that we had silos in funding that led to silos in delivery and that the money led to the way development was done. Now, silos aren't optimal for a couple of reasons. They are not optimal in terms of public health. A mosquito really doesn't care if it bites an HIV positive or an HIV negative person. A pregnant woman who sleeps under a bed net or receives antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy but dies during childbirth is no better off, nor is her child, nor is her family, nor is her community, than if she never received malaria, prophylaxis, or, or antiretroviral therapy. 
a child who is born to a H- mother who receives antiretroviral therapy and therefore has a mother but never gets immunized, treatment for neglect of tropical diseases, is not going to grow, is probably not going to be awake at school and won't become educated. And then you have a cycle of underdevelopment, of, un- of not integrated and not good health. But it also, silos also are extraordinarily inefficient and duplicative. And this is something we have seen with clarity because of disease-specific programs. We really didn't, we knew it was there, but we didn't see it so much when they had a bunch of pilot programs scattered all over the place. Once you had national scale-up of large programs for disease-specific interventions, it became crystal clear what the duplication and inefficiencies were. In many ways, it's because of disease-specific programs that we can actually talk about weak health systems and silos, as Susan said. The simple fact, in my own view, is that we could be doing three to four times more, which means we could be saving three to four times more lives today and every day because of the way we do development. If we did development differently, just with the money we have today, we could be saving and lifting up three to four times more lives. Another key lesson learned, in in my view, and this I've grown to feel very strongly about, is that when you combine, when an organization combines the provision of technical assistance or technical support with program dollars, you fundamentally undermine that key principle of country ownership. The fact of the matter is that you, there are lots of technical ways to do things. There are lots of partners out there. When you're providing technical support and providing program dollars, where do you think the program dollars are going to go if you're also providing the technical support? It's going to go to the areas that you provided the technical support for. And so by combining technical support and program dollars, we fundamentally prevent true country ownership. We fundamentally prevent achieving those goals of a new era in development. The last lesson learned I think we have learned is that we do need the current bilateral and multilaterals. There are problems with them, but there are key things they do. Guidelines, standards, technical support, accountability things that financing institutions cannot and should not do and that we need global institutions to do. So accepting the upsides and downsides of disease-specific programs, why don't we consider for a moment what the next genetic leap should be, what the next move along the arc of development should be, given what we've learned, and especially in the past decade. Before I lay out a few options, I want to make clear that what I'm talking about is external financing. There's an awful lot of internal financing that goes on, and we don't pay enough attention to that. But the fact of the matter is that large amounts of external financing can drive good behavior towards global health, or it can drive bad behavior towards global health. And right now, the large amounts of external financing are driving countries that want to have integrated approaches to health, because they understand the principles we just talked about, to do siloed programs, because that's how the money is provided. we, we, there's a lot that's important in internal financing, but we're just talking about external financing for now. So a couple of options. One is better coordination. It's a good approach. We've been doing this for, I don't know, 15 years, lots of efforts, lots of good efforts. We actually are far more coordinated today than we were 10 years ago, but it's not enough. And it's my deeply held fundamental belief that our current multilateral and bilateral structures are actually not genetically capable of integration. Virtually every incentive system built into them is against integration. Now, that's not a criticism of the institutions. They were created for a purpose. Each organization was created to achieve a goal or achieve some purpose. They were staffed that way. The culture and structure was created that way. That's what happened. That's how they were built. That's not a criticism of them. It's just we've grown beyond that. And it's certainly not a criticism of the people, because our development organizations are filled with some of the most talented, creative, exceptional people you will ever run across. But they're stuck in these cultures and structures that limits their ability to grow the way they should. So another option is to transform what we are doing and develop a mechanism for external financing that is, leads to country ownership and that supports and only supports integrated country national health plans. Now, not everything's going to be integrated. Some stuff doesn't, should not be integrated, but a lot should be, and a plan should be put together at the national level that tells whether or not you're integrating, how you're integrating, why you are, why you are not, and that that financing mechanism should be completely separated from technical support. 
so that you don't have that impediment to country ownership. Now, there are a couple ways to get there. One is to create something new. I'm not going to go into the 50,000 reasons why that's a bad idea, especially right now in our financial situation. We can talk about that later if anyone wants to. What are the options from what's out there today? Transforming the global fund is one of them. And I want to make clear I'm talking about transforming the global fund, not expanding its mandate. The fund as it exists today could not do what I am suggesting. It would need fundamental change in many of its structures and many of its approaches. It needs to be transformed. But the Global Fund is the only institution out there that was created specifically to respond to those principles of the Monterey Consensus, the Paris Accord, and the, our Paris Declaration, and the Accra Accord. It was created for country ownership, results-based, all, all sectors engaged, and um, uh, good governance. Another possibility, and this is the one I actually favor, is better alignment between the Global Fund, the World Bank, and other institutions. And the way I would suggest we do this is to have one review panel for integrated national health strategies that crosses the different organizations, that is composed of the different organizations, that is separate from technical support, which would be provided by multilaterals, bilaterals, even from those institutions. But there would be a clear wall between the financing institution and the technical support. Countries would request technical support when they want it, either as they're creating an application, during the application process, or after they get questions on the application. But it's their plan, it's their request, it's their ask, it's country-driven technical support, not coming from someone else. And then you'd have to have a structure where you'd go through the governance boards. So I don't have a lot of any time left, actually, so I'm going to kind of end there. But all I want to say is that we have had these evolutionary changes. And what I'm proposing is another evolutionary change. I also want to make it clear that this is the next step. I would expect to have something completely new in 10 to 15 years. As countries grow and expand, develop economically, develop better mechanisms and stronger accountability mechanisms, we should transform this mechanism. How we require reporting should depend on performance. A country that's performing well should almost have a pass through in terms of grant processes and other approaches. But we have to change what we're doing. And to come back to the initial question, if we could create an approach to global health and architecture, would we create what we have today? And I don't think there's any question the answer is no. So rather than fitting a vision into our current structures, why don't we fit our current structures or recreate our structures to fit a vision that will lead to integrated health that will lift up and save as many lives as possible? And in this moment in history, which don't come often, we have the opportunity to do that. So with, that many, with so many lives at stake, I think it's a moral imperative that we act now. Great. Thank you, Mark. I think we're in an unusual position here. I just want to test this out. It seems as if we have a resolution that the Global Fund be transformed to the Global Fund for Health that nobody is in favor of on this panel. No, I am <laughs> in favor of it. Um, because, I just want, because you said that you, your preferred option was better alignment between the existing Global Fund and the World Bank and other institutions. I should have clarified. Okay. It would be alignment with a transformed Global Fund so that the Global okay. Fund is uh, receptive to and is one of the principal, if not the principal, organization for an integrated approach to global health. You just have different funding streams for it. But okay. you would still have to transform. The Global Fund today could not serve that function. OK, so it's a two-step procedure. Two -step transform procedure. the Global Fund and then better align. OK, good. Thank you for clarifying that. I was getting worried that I was going to have to argue for the resolution because no one else would. All right, Julian, you have three minutes to respond. Um, Am I going to ask some yes. questions? I'm going yes. to ask. Them. Yes, well, exactly. firstly, questions. let me say that if this is Mark when he's not coherent, um, <laughs> I'd be right. horribly worried if he were more coherent because it's. Uh, but let me just ask a, a couple of questions, Mark. Um, I don't quite understand this issue you you talk about uh, that this division between TA and money, mm -hmm. because isn't it likely TA, of course, uh, to technical, technical assistance. assistance? Isn't it rather likely? that if you make that division too extreme, you will end up with one group of people who are essentially designing things which suit what the, the funders actually want, as opposed to uh, what uh, perhaps would be what the, the clients want. 
This, isn't this what has perhaps already happened, let's say, with USAID in a, in a recent piece which Andrew uh, Natsios uh, developed? So, I mean, why would that be such a good thing? Well, first of all, I don't agree with Andrew. I mean, the notion that um, USAID no longer has technical capacity or support is just flat out wrong. There's huge technical support. They do it all the time. Their program officers spend an enormous amount of time providing technical support. They're in the field all the time. Uh, what is true is that they're not full-time staff anymore. They're all contractors. But the notion that USAID does not provide technical support is just flat out wrong. I hate to disagree with the for former administrator, but it's just not right. Um, and I think that's part of the problem, that uh, when the people who provide technical support are also the program officers that decide whether or not something gets financed, what are they likely to say we should finance? what they think should be financed based on their technical support and merit. Which, if you're the country, means you're stuck. Because you have, what your, your view is actually has to be molded to their view. Whereas if you have the countries putting together their plans and saying, look, we, we have a hole here. We don't have a, a very good idea how to structure this financial approach. We need someone to help us do that. But we know that's a problem. Or you have a review panel that says, nice, very good application, lots of important things. But here are a couple things that you should think about and that you missed. And then the country can say, you're right. Let me call on this group of consultants or technical people who can come support what I want. But it all then fits in the national strategy and the national plan. I think the fundamental problem is when you have external partners who both give the advice and fund, you're going to wind up funding what they gave advice to fund for. And it took me a while to understand this, to be honest. It took a while uh, watching how PEPFAR evolved, watching how our US agencies and our multilateral agencies function to realize how deeply that undermines our principle of country ownership. And I've talked to many ministers about this who actually agree completely. Yeah, I've got a lot of questions, but they'll come up in, what I'm, in my sort of uh, statement. But just one other sort of thought for you. Question. You know, in education, you talk a lot about teaching to the test. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got one very large global funding agency, which has, like all agencies, certain idee fixes, yeah. certain ideas. This is the path to nirvana, and we know because we know because we have all the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you talk about country ownership. Yeah, yeah. How, when you have a single funding agency, uh, and you have a small country, is that country going to be able to withstand the global juggernaut yeah. and not get crushed? Yeah, yeah, it's an outstanding <coughs> point. And, um, um, and here I'm contradicting myself from five years ago because Richard Feach and I actually had this debate at an IAS conference where I made this exact point. That having <laughs> one institution was actually dangerous. And I actually think five years ago that was probably correct. And as I said, we still need bilaterals and multilaterals. They still need to be around. They need to be around for a lot of different reasons. And I think you need to keep a healthy competition. And that's one of the reasons I like a transform global fund, but also other financing mechanisms around too. And then we need to have a pretty good global agreement on what we mean and what we expect these institutions to achieve. And if you start falling down on your job, there's nothing to say in the next fiscal year, the funders won't say, you actually didn't do what you're supposed to do. We're going someplace else. And so you, you would have to have that kind of global agreement. You would have to have kind of benchmarking. And you'd have to have constant evaluation of those institutions to make sure they were keeping to those principles uh, that you sought out. But I think it's a real point and something that very much would need to be paid attention to. All right, so with the uh, potential of the big, hairy, global juggernaut <laughs> fund uh, in the <coughs> offing, if we were to go Mark's route, let's turn over now to Julian and ask you to argue your statement in the negative on the resolution. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm almost in, in complete agreement with Mark on the, the diagnosis. Uh, th there are clearly fault lines in delivering health care in silos, and patients clearly need integrated services which respond to a wide variety of needs. We've all seen the result, freestanding single disease clinics which don't serve local needs well, duplication of projects with existing facilities or which steal scarce health workers, cars lined up in Ministry of Health garages which can only be used for a single project. That's one of my favorites. Uh, and there's often 
let me say, a mismatch between the burden of disease and the flow of development assistance for health, which results in a clear mismatch between supply and demand. And simple process, just as an example, simple processes such as hand washing are vastly more cost effective than vaccinations against diarrheal disease, but hand washing gets little attention and no funding. And this is a, an example of the siloed approach. So I have no disagreement on that. I also agree that I think we can get far more health for the money by improved harmonization, by different practices, uh, and uh, <coughs> We have to do better. I mean, the stories of the 650 plus health indicators demanded of the Rwandans or the multiple audit systems which Ethiopia has to maintain to meet the mutually inconsistent financial management demands of the donors, these are all famous and we, the, 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 the diagnosis is clear. But having done this diagnosis and recognizing the efforts made to improve harmonization, does the expansion of the global fund into a super global fund for health uh, make sense? Will that proposed cure help alleviate the problem or might it make it worse? Just a few background facts. We've seen a huge expansion from five to about 22 billion in about 17 years. But actually this vastly underestimates the real spending on the health MDGs because for example, probably there's been 10, 8 or 10 billion has been spent in the last decade alone on infrastructure related to health, such as water supply and sanitation. And the World Bank estimates that 175 million people have access to clean water. As a result, those numbers don't tend to get into this. And one really crucial question is how do you integrate this stuff into the global health agenda? Because health is much bigger than, as we know, ministries of health. And, you know, a recent Lancet article attributes much of the decline in maternal mortality in Africa to improved education of girls, another example of the multi-sectoral nature of this. Mark mentioned, but I think needs much more elucidation, is this issue that actually development assistance for health only comprises a small fraction of health spending, maybe 20% in Africa, 3% in South Asia. So we've got to be careful. What happens to the other 80%, and how does that get integrated into this debate? And I want to make another point. Over 50% of health spending in low-income countries is private. And more than 50% of health providers are non-government. So again, we have to be very careful in thinking about new mechanisms that we really this time don't ignore these crucial players who tended, have tended to be completely ignored in the past. Look at WHO. It still doesn't recognize the private sector. See, I can speak now. I don't work for the World Bank. <laughs> Other point I want to make, the US is by far and away the largest contributor to development assistance for health. And private philanthropy in the US is a huge contributor, it's 30%. And I don't need to tell you which, there's one big behemoth out there which is 50% of that. So a question is, are they going to integrate themselves and put all their money into this global health fund? Probably not. Anyway, back to the discussion. Why do I think that expanding the global fund uh, might not work. Eight basic reasons. Mark argues that the solution to the problems created by the current fragmented and uncoordinated system is to expand the global health fund into a large, what I'm calling global, global quasi-funding monopoly, while others do the design, monitoring, and TA, avoiding the conflict of interest whereby the global fund would be simultaneously designer, financier, and monitor of its own funded programs. But I want to point out this is how the, GA, the global fund was originally designed to be a lean funding organization re relying on others to do the implementation and evaluation. It now has over 600 and counting staff sitting in one of the most expensive cities in the world. What happened? The stakeholders began to insist on in-house expertise and specialization, not just in the three diseases, but in supporting issues such as gender, financial management, procurement, et cetera, et cetera. I would argue that expanding the functions of the currently structured global fund will simply create a vastly bigger bureaucracy. It is unrealistic to think that an expanded global fund will simply delegate all the specialized functions in maternal and child health, let alone nutrition, water supply, and so on, to other agencies any more than it has been able to delegate these in the past. The conflict of interest problem, already severe, could get much worse. Second, even if it could become more streamlined and efficient, and I'll argue in a minute that I think that's unlikely, why would a monopoly be a good thing? Are monopolies generally efficient and do they meet client needs? We should not assume that health <coughs> is so different from any other economic and social sectors, and I propose that some competition is actually a good thing. 
competition of ideas, innovation, financing, procurement, etc. Government needs agencies which are highly responsive to client needs. I entirely agree with uh, Mark. We need to be supporting country plans. But monopolies, be they global health monopolies or others, are not famous for stimulating innovation, responsiveness, or cost effectiveness. <coughs> Third, would this global fault policy be feasible? I personally can't imagine that the large bilateral donors, the large philanthropic organizations, or the multilateral banks will give up their own grant making or lending services to accommodate the expanded global fund. As Mark notes, the worst possible solution is an expanded mandate without requisite funding. But this is a serious danger. Would a private philanthropy interested in developing new vaccines simply hand over its resources to the expanded global fund? Put simply, how will the GEF manage research and development? It's likely that the unfunded mandate would result in increased global fund intervention, participation in international meetings, etc., without any serious funding, expertise, or authority. Next point. As I noted above, many health outcomes are not necessarily linked to health-specific investments. You know, we can think of water supply, girls' education, road traffic safety, road tra accidents kill huge numbers of people in poor countries. It, thus, if the Global Fund would handle the health-related MDGs generically, it would have to duplicate many of the functions of other agencies, including the multilateral development banks. But as I suggested, these agencies would not stop their own uh, lending and grant making for non-health related issues such as infrastructure. And so there could be more, not less, fragmentation. Does the Global Fund have the expertise to seek financing for health related infrastructure? And should it? Next point. Similarly, since so much of health spending is private, out of pocket, which we know is the worst option for the poor, there's a huge need to introduce effective community and national health insurance systems and to ensure that these systems are linked to the broader financial sector. Again, what would be the benefit of duplicating existing financial institutions and expertise? In summary, to fulfill its new mandate, the new uh, Global Fund would need to become a multi-sectoral organization, in essence mimicking what the multilateral, uh, multilateral uh, development banks do now. Now, even if all this were a good idea, it would require, as Mark notes, a radical change in the governance of the Global Fund. Mark acknowledges this in his paper, I, I, which I, by the way, I should acknowledge is a great paper, but skates over what I think are the formidable challenges. The good news about the current Global Fund is that it is representative of many health actors, civil society, governments, private sector, philanthropy, etc., And it can achieve a degree of consensus and ownership as a result. However, that is being achieved at a cost. Predictably, the Global Fund has evolved into a large and cumbersome bureaucracy with a complex governance system. As in all international bodies, different interest groups lobby hard. Decision making can be painfully slow. Recipients complain about lengthy and complex disbursement procedures. Each Global Fund round can gobble up an enormous amount of ministerial time and attention. Next week's uh, MDG Summit will hopefully release some new pledges for global health, but it would take a superb optimist to believe that there will be anything like the 22 to $45 billion per annum needed. Pressure to maintain or increase funding for the Global Fund's current portfolio will undoubtedly be severe and somewhat justified. And under these circumstances, placing all this new money into the Global Fund would be unlikely to ensure equitable funding for non-infectious diseases. Again, as Mark has noted, the end result will probably be an expanded mandate with few additional resources. Finally, let me look at the effectiveness issue. Mark argues correctly that the Global Fund has been a very effective mechanism to save lives. And if you look at their website, by their count, the Global Fund has, saved, has invested over $19 billion to save uh, about 5.7 million lives since the start of its operations. No bad feat. But how have other agencies done? That's difficult to know because other agencies haven't used the Global Fund methodology to evaluate their own systems. And thus, we don't really have any value for money comparisons. I would argue that that would be an essential prerequisite for this debate. 
I do know that the World Bank will soon publish its own estimates of lives saved through its multi-sectoral investments using the Global Fund methodology. And I understand that their preliminary estimates suggest that more than 30 million lives have been saved over the same period using a combination of investments valued at 21 billion. This is not to make a direct comparison. What it strongly suggests is that we need to evaluate the impact of these different funding modalities using common criteria across agencies to see how we are doing. And second, that diversity of approaches may actually be highly beneficial. We may get more bang from the buck from having different approaches. I'll stop there because we'll have a chance to sum up or with, with possibly to talk about some alternatives. Great. Indeed. Thank you very much. All right. Mark, you have a chance now to ask questions. So well, please. first of all, I agree with, I think, everything you said. Um, uh, um, <laughs> I think that, that, so I want to ask a broad question. Um, but first thing I ask a nitpicky question, and maybe this is because I'm just defensive because I was chair of the Finance and Audit Committee of the Global Fund when it grew to 600 people, which I agree is large. But for money managed, uh, how many people does the Gates Foundation currently employ? 600. Uh, why, how many people, I'll go after ourselves, how many people does the US government employ for HIV AIDS? I happen to know in the vicinity, if you go to all the countries, 6,000, 7,000. So when you're talking about numbers of people, you know, and the World Bank isn't exactly short yeah. on staff either. So, um, I, you know, I think the 600 in my own game, it gets blown up. But I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a fair point. I, I try to use it to say that it started out trying to be a very lean, yeah. mean organization, which would just do funding, yeah. leaving everything to everybody else. It yeah. hasn't succeeded in doing that. So there is already a lot of uh, duplication. And I think one of its problems is sitting in Geneva. It has no country yeah. um, basis. And therefore, it has become a very centralized uh, yeah. bureaucracy. I think that's a fair point. But wasn't the point of that so that the other organizations, so that it did not get involved in mm. technical areas? And I'm actually not aware of a technical part of the fund. Now, Refod's building some monitoring and evaluation capacity, mm. but they actually don't have a what we would consider normal technical mm. staff, unless I'm missing something. Is that correct? Well, I think they. I mean, I think they. They now actually adopt a quasi-technical function. It maybe is inevitable. Yeah. I mean, if you are shelling out nearly twenty billion bucks, your stakeholders demand that you have people who are more than just you know green eye shade types who can yeah. you know disperse the money. Yeah. They need, and, and I think that that's an inevitable yeah. feature. And that's a good point. Unless your own organizations, using the US for example, does that evaluation for you. So we've never wanted them to have that technical support mm. so we can do it. Let me just ask you a bigger question though, because it's the one that, because I do agree with almost everything you said. How do you reconcile, um, and where, where, what should we do? I mean, uh, you know, everyone always way overuses Churchill's line, you know, democracy is the worst institution except mm. for everything else. I don't know that what I'm proposing is the best solution. All I, but in my own limited view, it's the only solution to get out of the problem. So once recognizing the problem, I agree with all the problems you raised, the political problems, the turf problems, we're gonna have a lot. So what would we do? What would we do to solve the problem of the inefficiencies and the um, in totally separated way we're delivering healthcare? What's another solution? Because I'm perfectly open to another one if there is one. Yeah. Well, I, I think actually we do have a number now of country examples of countries that have actually got hold of this problem and have begun to solve it for themselves. And I've, my own experience of this is that no amount of um, re-engineering at the international level is going to make this work. You use the word like sort of it's in, in the genetics, and I think I agree with that. I think where it has to happen is that you have to have countries that have the the uh, capacity to be able to control the donors, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think we have quite a number of countries now in Africa and Asia, yeah. you know, India, Cambodia, Rwanda, Tanzania, yeah. which are very good examples. Yeah. I think we should learn from these countries how have they done this? How have they gone about having Ethiopia, for example, a single country health plan and insisting that 90% of the the development assistance goes into that plan. They've done it. Yeah. Now, the problem, I think, is in the weak countries, the fragile states, the countries that simply can't control the donors. We see this in natural disasters over and over again. You know, I, I, the, the, the solution there, I think, again, has to be to provide more assistance 
at the country level to help them actually control ourselves. Yeah. Uh, because I don't think anything we do at the international level deals with the problem of fragmentation at the country level. And the second point to say is I think we need to ensure and encourage that we continue to have a competition of ideas. I mean, God knows we really don't quite know what to do. Otherwise, we presumably we would have solved it by now. And I think that this competition of ideas, of innovation, you see, I think one of the great strengths of the Global Fund has been that it, and it actually provided some competition. Mm -hmm. It actually got mm -hmm. other organizations off their backsides and having to start to think about why are we not consulting civil society? Why are we not doing these things? That was its great strength. I think we've got to somehow make sure that that competition stays. Right. <coughs> All right. Well, this is a good point for the moderator to wade in and make the obvious point that I'm sure is apparent to all of you that there's a lot of convergence here. Uh, you've heard just in the last few minutes that they both essentially agree on the problem. Uh, the problem is insufficient country <coughs> ownership, excessive donor domination of the process, uh, uh, tendency for large institutions to become larger institutions and more bureaucratic. Uh, lack of harmonization among the various programs, a need for more coordination. You, you agree on the problem. Uh, you agree to of a large degree on the solution. You don't buy the notion of switching the mandate of the global fund. It doesn't even sound as if you're completely persuaded that that has to be the way to go, although you can correct We're me. Pretty, right. I'm oh. pretty convinced that it's got a oh. good piece of it. Yeah. Okay. What I do hear uh, is, Julian, you saying, what needs to happen is more coordination at the country level vis-a-vis -vis the donors. Mark, you are saying more coordination at the international level, although you're not discounting the notion of the, the countries getting. No, 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 I actually agree, compl I, no, I actually agree okay. completely. It's all got to happen at the country level. Um, and what, what I'm trying to propose is to get everyone else out of the way so the countries can do that. So uh, I think we agree completely on that piece of it without question. Mm. I just think that for those, we have great examples of places that have worked. We have a lot more examples of where they haven't worked. And where they have worked is fundamentally where the ministries and people have said, all right, you're going to do it this way or you're not going to work in my country. And this is how it's mm -hmm. going to get done. Mm -hmm. But many countries can't do that. So I agree with you completely. What I'm trying to do is propose something that for the next 10 to 15 years, we get everyone to that point so that we would be in a much different position. And it was hard for those countries to do that. It's still hard. I was just in Ethiopia. They're still beating their heads over the wall, trying to put all these pieces together, which is a huge transaction cost for them. They spend an enormous amount of time trying to put all those pieces together when they could be spending all that time improving health. So I think we agree almost on everything. It's just, should we transform the global fund to be a principal financing mechanism along with <coughs> other mechanisms, uh, World Bank, Regional development banks, I agree, completely should be a piece of Once you have that national strategy, then all the spigots can come in. All right, well, let's try to uh, articulate what difference this would really make, how this would really work in the real world. Uh, as you've noted, we have countries that already have forced the donors into some form of alignment, whether it's Ethiopia, Rwanda, et cetera. So sketch the vision for me five years from now. Country X uh, decides that it wants to do some new things with its HIV AIDS program, coordinate with maternal child health, whatever, whatever it is. What is different about the process? OK, so, and I think this is a key point. Uh, and I would say, too, that I actually agree that that should be multi-sectoral. I just think you have to start with something. My longer term vision would be that after you did this with health, you would do something, not the same fund, but you'd do something very similar. So you're basically building a global society, integrating education and food and everything else into one piece. I just don't think you can start with the whole thing. There are enough problems starting with just this piece. So let the, the way it would work, and, and this is why I think the global fund is so important, because it did lay out it was created to respond to those principles. It was created. It's the only institution other than the Millennium Challenge Corporation that was created to respond to the Monterey Consensus, the, the Paris Declaration of Oracle. It was actually created in every piece, culture and structure to do that. Now, it doesn't mean it's achieved all those, but at least the principles and the structure are there. So the structurally, what it would look like to me is that instead of the coordinator for HIV AIDS for the United States telling Rwanda, you have $130 million next year for HIV AIDS. You guys come back to me with your plan for how you're going to use it. 
The agencies get together. They send huge technical teams out. They all basically tell the government what they should do. They come to, and civil society. They bring them all together. They come up with a plan, send it back. Then the Global Fund comes in with the plan. And, that, and they go through an application process that does the same thing. But that's, the World a Bank, that's a country-led plan. Well, at the moment, it's a country-led right? plan, but you've got all these other people, because they have technical people, coming in to help the country decide what it wants to do. So you've got all these different groups coming in, telling them basically what they need to do. Then you have to report back to all of them in completely different ways. And then you have to take, the country has to take all these pieces and try to put it get together for that individual young woman who's trying to have, be healthy, manage her family, her family size, or not even have a family at all, manage the health of her child, manage the health of her. They have to put all that stuff together. And it doesn't work. And it, drive around in does, different cars. And drive around in different that. cars. When Michelle Kazik, where this really just knocked me over, we had an MOU in Ethiopia because the minister said, this is how we're going to do things. We had an MOU in Ethiopia on how the Global Fund and PEPFAR would work together. Michelle and I, or maybe it was a different country, I can't remember. Michelle and I went on a visit to say, oh, isn't this great how we're working together? We show up, we go through a clinic, looks beautiful, you know, Global Fund supporting us for this, we're doing this. We walk to the pharmacy, there's a PEPFAR side of the pharmacy, and there's a Global Fund side of the pharmacy. And the reason is because they had different report reporting yeah. requirements, so they had to have these separate pharmacies. It wasn't just because of you know, generic or non-generic or whatever, because we actually had all the generic. It was all the reporting requirements. So you're actually taking governments and countries, not just governments, but civil societies and governments, who are already weak, who already have weak infrastructures, and making them manage this mess and putting it all together <laughs> to try to take care of that person. And it's just not, it, it is so inefficient. So many people are dying. Even the good examples could be doing two to three times more today. So instead of all of that, instead of plan. all of that, the idea would be um, to have basically one review system um, for a national health strategy. And the national health strategy, I think, just within the health-related MDGs, I include uh, uh, nutritional for health in one and clean water in seven. To me, those are health-related Millennium Development Goals. Um, that you would come forward with one integrated health strategy. But it's not, it's not as if everything's integrated, because there's a lot of pieces in health you don't have integrated. <coughs> it would come forward from the government, uh, which means that you would involve the Minister of Finance. You would, you would have to, because the World Bank would be involved. But they would come forward with, this is our plan for an integrated approach. This is what it costs. Not too dissimilar to what the IHP did. You would have one panel that reviews that from across the different institutions. So it's not taking this plan necessarily to the big new global fund. It's taking it to the right. global fund plus, plus the World Bank plus all of these But the global fund would need to be transformed so that it's not funding individual diseases or individual <coughs> program areas. It's funding the national health program. And I actually think my own view is the global fund would become the center of that. Uh, and there are a couple reasons for that. One is it's the only institution. Uh, the World Bank does fund non-governmental activity, but fundamentally it funds governments. Uh, that the different development banks, regional development banks, have specific purposes. So in Africa, they pretty much just finance infrastructure. So let me just give you a, an example. A country would come forward with a plan um, that would include the private sector, the public sector, infrastructure, because you need a lot of infrastructure pieces, and maybe some, a couple of other components that none of these institutions particularly like to fund. You then have that plan. You would then have it go through a review process separate from technical support. The country would have asked for consultants from the World Bank. Hopefully, the multilaterals would come together and create teams of technical support so you get multiple pieces. They would come in and support the countries, but it's the country's decision. They asked for it to begin with. The plan would go forward. The approval, the body would say <coughs> yes or eh, you forgot about these two things. Send that back down. The country would then call in, if they wanted to, technical support to replace that as well. Once you got through that joint technical review process, it would be pretty much go to the governance boards and be a pro forma approval. But so, the, but the money would one flow through to the you don't have to You don't have to create one big pot of money. You would never create one big pot of money. You just have money spigots going in to the same national health strategy through different pieces. So the, global, the World Bank's money would always go to the government because the World Bank only works with governments. The African Development Bank, if they were involved, would just fund the pieces <coughs> of infrastructure because that's what they do. Um, the Global Fund would kind of 
fund the big picture. So you'd have different spigots coming in, and the Gates Foundation could join, other people could join. You'd have one national health strategy. Now, some people could say, well, what's, different? what's the difference between that and a, a PS uh, poverty reduction strategy plan? The difference to me is similar to what happened with AIDS plans. So before there was PEPFAR and the Global Fund, every country on paper had a national aid strategy. Most of them weren't the, worth the paper they were written on. Not surprising, there was no money. What was the incentive to them to put together a national health strategy? What was the incentive to, to spend the time to do it? Now, most of those countries have awfully strong national, health, national aid strategies, very robust. Uh, but then they have to force all the money in to fix it. And then that's separate from the malaria plan, which is separate from the uh, neglected tropical disease plan, which is separate from the clean water plan. So this would kind of pull all that together. And once you had a system with money behind it, I think you'd see countries creating those national health strategies in a way, and a systematic way of financing them. Okay, now, I agree me, with, I, but I want to say that I agree with Julian that in 10 years, that should look completely different. Because the countries would have moved to a point where we would have a completely different structure that would be, you know, we should just be doing audits at that point um, if it's done right. So what he's describing, you just heard, very coordinated mechanism. Country comes forward with one program based on its assessment reached with all of this other technical assistance of what it needs. One set of decisions is made. Uh, various, one monitoring system. One monitoring system. What's not to like about that, Julian? Well, I like it. And in fact, I would argue that much of it has begun to happen. Um, that through various initiatives over the last uh, over the last three or four years, the International Health Partnership, the recent efforts by the Global Fund, Gavi, uh, the Bank, uh, World Bank, and WHO to produce a kind of joint health systems platform, we are beginning to see now a sort of all of the main agencies coalescing around this concept of support for a national plan. Now, the one issue is that, of course, some countries have better plans than others. They are for all sorts of reasons, more advanced, they're more f further along the road, they know what they want, they have better political systems, they have better institutions of their own, they're more able to, to deal with the donors. But, I mean, I'll give you an example of a country which has just recently come out of very serious civil war, Nepal. Nepal is one of the first countries which has been able to conclude an agreement with all the major donors to support a single plan. An awful lot of this, the devil lies in the details. <coughs> The devil lies in stuff which I'm afraid most health specialists don't want to get involved with. Boring things like procurement and financial management. I know because I've actually dealt with some of these boring things. You find that agencies are wedded to different financial management systems which aren't necessarily compatible with a country's financial management system. Those are the issues which you have to deal with at the country level. A lot of this, I think, I would argue can happen through political will of the donors, which does not require any major restructuring of big agencies, which I fear will take a long time. Because I'm, maybe I'm slightly pessimistic, but uh, I notice, Mark, you talk about a 10-year horizon. I think it seems to take 10 years to reach any agreements to restructure any sort of international agencies. So I mean, I think that m we need to work not get bored with what we're doing, not sort of stop at this point, but really focus at the country level on these success stories, if you like, the positive deviants. Make them work better and use those as examples to other countries so we can begin to expand this much better country coordination out to, to other countries. I think that that in the sh is, in, in the next few years, a, a better approach. The w biggest worry I have is, you know, I don't see where new official aid money is coming from. I mean, look, uh, I hope I'm wrong. I hope next week, I I've worked on this. I've been part of the business creating this process next week. I very much hope that we are much more successful than I think we will be. But I don't see much money coming out next week. The most, most of the new money is going to come from the private sector from domestic funding, from innovation. And the Global Fund has been part of that innovation process. I want to give them credit. I mean, they've just signed a very um, innovative new scheme with Deutsche Bank. Mm -hmm. But these innovative financing mechanisms are going to be what produces the new money. 
And I think that, again, we need to have a number of different sources, which then channels in at the country level. I, I'm nervous about this concept of a single global entity. I just haven't ever seen a single global entity, which is very efficient, nimble. You know, they, they just don't work that way. All right, Mark, just quickly address that one point. Isn't this really, in the end, all about the money, not which institution lends the money? Uh, that seemed to be one of your essential points. Men answer that, and then we're going to go to audience questions. I actually ag agree to some extent, but, but I actually also don't agree. I think we have seen some, uh, some good examples, but they're nowhere near what there should be. And two years ago, the Global Fund, Gavi, and the World Bank announced that they were going to have a great way to work together. We're still waiting mm -hmm. for even some detail on what that's going to look like. So I, I think there's been good progress, but we need to jump. We need to jump it. We need an, a, mm -hmm. That's why I talk about an uh, evolutionary jump. We're, we're getting there, but we need something fundamentally different. The money piece, I think, is critical. You know, and I could be wrong. I've spent a lot of time, like you have, with people who, who hold the purse strings. And I firmly believe, and I could be wrong, that the economic crisis is in many ways being used as an excuse for not mm -hmm. funding, uh, increasing funding and development and global health. And I think the fundamental reason is we now see just glaringly the inefficiencies. And I think everyone has a sense that we could be doing two to three times more with the money we have today mm -hmm. if we were doing a more efficient, more efficient, well thought out, organized, uh, coordinated approach. And that it takes, t I agree with you too about creating something new is very problematic. But it's easier to do that than to fix 30 institutions simultaneously uh, that are engaged right now. I mean, I just don't see that as a rea reality. So I think we need to do something that will jump us to the next integration step to get us to that country ownership. And I firmly believe that if we did that, money would flow. I firmly believe that if we did that, we would have the ability to advocate for and gain resources that we would never have the ability to do before. Some of that comes from my personal experience in PEPFAR, but it also comes uh, from a lot of experience with the people holding the purse string. So I really think part of the problem the problem in financing is the way we're doing things. It's actually a little bit of cat and mouse. Art. All right. We would love to open this up to questions and discussion among you and the audience. I'd ask you to please to identify yourself by name and affiliation for the benefit of our uh, debaters. Please indicate whether you would like one or the other of them or both of them to address a particular question. We also have microphones available. And please avail yourself of a microphone before you speak so that we can capture it for the webcast, et cetera. Is there, did I see a hand up? I thought back there. OK, well, while we're waiting, perhaps, for questions to come forward, let me come back to this. Julian, do you accept that fundamental principle that we could be getting three to four times the gains in health and uh, reduction of disease burden with the existing money, and that really this would be a potential mechanism for inducing the kinds of efficiencies Mark is talking about? Well, I think there's, uh, on, on the question, can we get more money, can we get more health for the money? Absolutely, yes. I mean, just take the fact that some countries already get much more health for the money. You know, some countries have half the infant mortality rate of other countries spending per capita exactly the same amount of money. So the answer is there's twice as much money, health for the money just there if you could re uh, replicate those conditions. Now, there may be many reasons why that can't be done. So the answer is absolutely yes, you can get far more health for the money. I think that is often uh, 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 you know, because of absolutely um, moribund public systems of administration. Uh, you know, there are many examples. In, in one African country I know well, even when they had money to hire new health workers, 18 months later they had hired no new health workers. Why? Because their own civil service laws, because all these health workers are civil servants, made it impossible, and probably graft and corruption, many reasons. Now, I think that a, an awful lot can be, has to be done in country through health reform, through whatever we want to call it, health system strengthening. I mean, I hate that word, but for want of any better one. We agree uh, on that, too. We agree on that, too. <laughs> what, uh, what, what, what's a better one? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't know why. So I would say health services strengthening, but it doesn't mean by, by developing you know, innovation, looking at things like results-based financing, we know that, for example, conditional cash transfers, many things like that seem to be able to have incentive effects to make uh, 
uh, health workers more responsive, people more willing to uh, demand services. I think there is an IT revolution which is beginning to now uh, hit us. I, truth in advertising is something I'm working on in, in, in results for development, so I'm a, I'm a, a true believer. But uh, you know, I think there are many things that are needed, which are, many of them are outside the health sector, which will, are needed you know, to be able to improve. Just as another example, I mean, procurement. One of the areas where I think the Global Fund and Gavi have not done a good job is in trying to reduce the costs of, ba of uh, medical goods and services. Um, many reasons for that. There are huge possibilities there. If you can get um, different procurement practices, if, there's huge wastage. There's huge wastage in stockouts. You know, we've all seen this everywhere. Uh, in e I remember in Ethiopia looking at one drug repository, government drug repository, which looked like a bomb had hit it. I mean, and it was full of uh, drugs provided by the Global Fund. I mean, it's, it could have been the World Bank, so it didn't make a difference. But I mean, the fact is, there are massive savings. Now, do these savings, or will many of these efficiencies, remember what I said, that only maximum 20% of expenditures come from, uh, from development assistance. The other 80% is what you're going to have to deal with if you're really going to get a lot more health for the money. And I worry that we spend far too much time on that 20% or 3% in South Asia, and not nearly enough helping governments and countries. And this whole, and, and with the public and the private sector, the civil society inside, developing visions for health care which deal with this issue of far more bang for the buck. And also take into account the enormous amount of money on the private side. A huge amount could. of money. And the philanthropic flows. I mean, there are philanthropies which are spending in countries more than the government is spending, but they don't necessarily show up on the government books at all. So I think all of this needs to be come together. But I don't see this coming together necessarily easily at the global level. It has to come together at the country level with a lot of pushing and prodding and assistance from many different agencies coming at it from different perspectives. One of the things I'd like to suggest is we can do much better is a much better division of labor. One of the problems with the, at the present with the health um, I agenda is everybody says we're expert in everything. There's, you know, you go around to Gavi, the Global Fund, World Bank, and everybody's an expert in everything. There's never, nobody says, actually, hey, we're not. Why don't you do that? Which is surprising. <laughs> you know, even with 600 people or, you know, whatever the number is, you'd be a bit amazed. I don't think many of us who know these people are surprised. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. You know, I, I think we need, I think we could, we could work out with the main agencies much better division of labor, which would be part of of a, 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 a rationalization of approaches, which would, could be immensely beneficial if you began to think of the, the system as a system and you said, now, who really is best to do health insurance? Who is best to look at infectious diseases? Who is best to look at issues of bed nets and, 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 you know, and whatever it is, incentives? I think you could find that you would begin to get a, a, you know, a different structure. At the moment, all you're seeing is a sort of, we can all do it, we'll, we will all do it. All right, uh, let's see. I saw, thought I saw a hand go up here. Let's take that question. I'm Selena Schocken from Population Services International. And it, it strikes me in the countries that we work in that there are some countries that are global fund countries and there are some countries that are really more ready for bilateral assistance. And maybe we need sort of a combination where some countries, like Rwanda, Ethiopia, those examples that are constantly thrown out, but we don't have very many examples of those. Those countries have a national system that can define what their needs are, and it works. But we also have a whole bunch of countries that are not doing terribly well in the global <coughs> fund model because they haven't figured out how to involve their whole civil society and their private sector and get everyone working together. And they might have a system that looks like it involves everybody, but it, we know it doesn't work. So shouldn't we be using the PEPFAR approach in the countries to move them towards the global fund model and over time that be the goal, but we're not there yet. Um, because it, it seems like if we would adopt a global fund model where the countries define their needs, that so many people are being left aside and that we have poor performance in many of those countries. Um, and, and what we don't want is that those countries don't get more funding because many of those countries are losing large amounts of their global fund funding through no-goes because their grants are being reduced because they're not able to get the job done. And in those places, we need bilateral assistance. All right, Mark, take that on first, if you would. 
Well, I don't think there's any inconsistency in that. It gets back to Julian's point of division of labor. What's the division of labor? And to me, the right division of labor, because I just don't think we can fix the, the turf has gotten to the point where fixing everyone, getting someone to say, I'm not good at that right now, is to me a bigger lift. Uh, I'd love to see it happen. I just don't think we've been doing division of labor for, I don't know, 15 years uh, and various projects. What I'm suggesting is that we precisely get to that point so that the country owns their project, but with technical support available in a way that will get them to the point where they can get, get there on their own. Um, and that that would always be available and always always there. And the division of labor to me is that you have financing institutions which would go through these mechanisms that provide the resources, but you have technical groups which I think would be the current multilaterals and bilaterals that would create the technical support that's necessary to get countries along. But that the countries have to be very much involved in deciding where they do and don't have a problem. But they also will have some direction early on from the financing institution because they're not going to finance it if it's not in that direction. And so you create the incentive structures to provide the technical support in a way that leads to financing and pulls those pieces together. So that's exactly, I'm arguing for a division of labor, just a different type of division of labor, to get each country along that pathway. And I, again, I do not accept that Rwanda and Ethiopia are functioning as well as they could. I just got back from Ethiopia and I was in Rwanda six months ago. They could be in a whole lot better if we didn't mess up their ability to do what they wanted to accomplish. So we, we point to these examples, but they could still be doing two to three times more with the money that they have today if we allowed them to go in a little bit different direction. So I agree with the division of labor. I agree that countries are going to take work to get there. The question to me is how is that work done? And who makes the decisions and who really directs that? And to me, it's got to move away from us directing them to them directing themselves. And it's only when we give them that freedom and that space, this is probably the only thing I agree with them, Miso Moyo, about, that it's only when we give them that space and that almost responsibility to do that that we'll start to change things. And you know, one thing President Kagame told me once that will always, and just he told President Bush this actually, that will always stick with me is, you know, the one thing I liked about PEPFAR is you held us to a high standard. We weren't being viewed as a basket case anymore that needed all of you to come in and help and run our programs for us and provide. You actually said you are responsible to achieve your goals, and we believe you can. We'll be here to stand with you, but we think you can. That changes everything. And so I'm arguing that we give the countries that space to succeed and fail, and that we provide a system that supports the evolution in that way, because we don't have that right now. And I just don't see, I wish there were another way to do it. I struggle, and maybe there is. Maybe we can come up with another way. To me, this is the best of bad approaches. Mark, help us understand how important to your proposal is the shift of focus for the Global Fund on the funding side. I mean, the loans, whatever grants it makes, would go, as I understand it, to a more holistic approach on the part of the country. How important is that piece of it versus just the review process and the coordination uh, across the agencies? Both. Because the way the fund is structured right now, you'd still have to have a country coming forward with a program area around HIV, or a program area around malaria, or a program area around TB, or if we added maternal and child health, another. We're basically replicating all the bad things about our current structures. That's not why we created the fund. So it would actually be to transform the fund to be a fund that finances integrated health approaches, not individual program areas. Advances were made with the architectural review that was just done, but it doesn't go anywhere near far enough. I mean, we still have separate program areas for HIV and TB in highly endemic areas. How much sense does that make? So, but the fund is open and is new enough that it can change. Its whole model is built around the ability to change and do that. So first you have to transform so it's a financing institution for integrated health because it is not right now. And then you need to fit it into the broader picture of uh, how would you then ensure that spigots from other sources are all supporting one national health strategy. It's basically HIP, IHP plus plus plus. Uh, but it with, um, and what the fund and World Bank and Gavi are already trying to do, but it's actually pushing it way beyond what they're currently thinking of uh, in a real genetic yeah. group. And why, why, that sounds like a pretty rational idea as well, Julian. Why is it not? No, it is. I mean, I, I, I think we, we're really, you know, we're talking about who, who has the funds. I think 
you know, the argument for essentially a budget support for health based on an output-based aid model, which is exactly what PEPFAR was doing. I, w you agree with the recipient about the results you expect. And you get much less engaged in the micromanagement of the details. So you, know, you, 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 you set outputs and outcome, outcomes and output and, and intermediate indicators. You measure them. You monitor them. You help them where they need help. But you don't say, this is the way you have to do this. You don't sub, you know, the way we work at the moment is exactly against public finance 001. We slice and dice budgets. We silo them. This is, ends up with the 10 cars in the car park, which can't be used for different processes. This ends up with separate clinics for HIV and TB in the same hospital. Uh, you know, all, all of the horror stories. And huge waste and duplication. And that is exactly what, if you, you know, when you learn public finance, you, you, this is not how we would expect any Western or rich country would never dream of deal, doing budget this way. But this is what we impose on poor countries. And then complain afterwards they don't use the money efficiently. And, you know, we're, and then we send in legions of experts to help them spend the money efficiently when the fundamental problem is budget. But that requires you to essentially pool funds as much as you can at the country level and be able to then, as I said, have a single monitoring system. This point that we all agree on, you know, you don't have 650 indicators. You have 15 or 20 or 25 indicators. But then you also have to have the guts to be able to pool money when things are not working. And that's very, very difficult because you have to always think who's being hurt. But if you don't have a mechanism whereby money gets pulled, if the country is not achieving those results, if you don't have that mechanism, then of course it's going to fail. But so again, I think we have to find mechanisms to, to pool funds, encourage and stimulate competition of ideas and, and, and innovation, and then things, some things fail always with innovation. And avoid, I think, too many monopolies at any level of this system. Because I, I, as I said, I worry that you have this system whereby you have a big behemoth which will know what needs to be done. And countries will go along with it. I mean, I think already you begin to get a little bit of that in the whole round, Global Fund round issue, which is an extremely time-consuming process for countries. And uh, you know, because they know roughly, I think already now, what you know, they think is going to be successful. And I think we have to, you have to avoid some of those problems. So again, I mean, I'm not, I, I think Mark and I have very much agreement on what has to be at the country level. I think we're really talking about whether you know, this, this creation of this thing at the global level is the solution and going to help at the country level. That's really the point. All right, well, I'd now like to move to some wrap-up statements. And I'd like you to structure them in the following way. Let's assume you're going to a, a meeting of the board of the Global Fund. You're going to make the pitch to them and to the employees of the Global Fund why, in just a, about a minute or two, why this is the greatest idea that anybody's ever heard, why they should switch their focus from HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria to broader health, uh, restructure their funding accordingly, uh, work more closely across agencies to do review processes, et cetera. You're going to make that pitch, and you're the consultant who comes in to tell them that that is the dumbest idea that <laughs> has ever been floated and why they should oh, not go that direction. <laughs> So you've clearly never been to a global fund board meeting because nothing happens in a minute or two. I know yes. this is why it's yes. complete are you, I fantasy. See, are you talking about three days? I'll tell <laughs> you a story this about that. This is why it's complete <laughs> fantasy. But yeah. okay, so here we are, Geneva. Three minutes, Mark. So it goes back to what we started with. What we care about is not a structure. What we care about is not a bureaucracy. What we care about is a person in a village, and. What does that one person need for their health and for the health of their family? Do they need separate institutions providing them with HIV, TB, family planning, malaria, water? Is that good for them? Is that an efficient way? Is that going to make them a healthy person? Or if we only give one or the other? We have to start thinking about what is it we're about. That's what we're about. We're about that person. So if that's our starting point, then what do you structure to care for that person? And it's pretty clear you don't structure things the way we've structured them today. And the global fund needs to be transformed to a way that provides health 
for that person and that family, which means supporting an integrated approach to health. Again, not everything is integrated. There are individual services that can be provided separately, but it has to be a holistic approach that will save the largest number of lives for the least amount of money and think about what that individual person needs. And then we need to structure ourselves that way. Now the biggest worry, and I hear this all the time, is as soon as you do that, you lose the accountability. That's nonsense. You still have reporting on the number of kids sleeping under a bed net. You still have reporting on the number of women with access to services for unlooked pregnancy. You still have reporting on all those indicators, but you're delivering the services not by those indicators, but by thinking about that person. And the fund structures exist. This is not a big lift for the Global Fund. This would take six to 12 months of intensive work to restructure. And the reason I support so strongly the fund doing it is because with my own experience with the US government, that would take about 40 years. And I'm still not sure we'd achieve it. The fund, and the fund was created to do this. We created the Global Fund to respond to those principles of country ownership, results-based, good governance, and all sectors engaged. It was actually, the culture and structure was actually created to respond to those. We're not stuffing them into pre-existing structures. We're not trying to force pre-existing structures to do something they weren't created to do. We're actually giving the opportunity for an institution that was created in a certain way to flourish. So the Global Fund needs to transform to that direction, but it's going to require money to do it. And, but until we transform and until we make those changes, we're not going to get the money because the people with the money are looking and saying, I don't want to fund HIV alone anymore. I don't want to fund TB alone anymore. I don't want to fund malaria anymore alone because they're not efficient, because that's not the way to take care of that person. So if we don't change, not only are we going to save that person's lives, but we're not going to save a whole bunch of other people's lives because we're not going to have the money to do it. All right, now the consultant, you're here to tell us why that <laughs> is all hogwash. <laughs> no, no, it's not all hogwash, but I'm going to say that Okay, we've just sat through a five-day meeting of the Global Fund, which <laughs> followed a 10-day meeting of the Policy and Strategy Committee and the Finance and Audit Committee. And during that time, as we know, moving the, anywhere just an inch is an enormous effort and requires UN-style resolutions and midnight discussions about whether you can have a comma after the word but or before it. And so, I don't think, Global Fund, you are actually any longer quite so nimble as your um, publicity and literature uh, pretends. And before we go any further in expanding your remit, I think there are a number of things you need to do with Global Fund which could make you a lot more efficient and uh, effective and efficient. I think one of the things you have to do is to become much more willing to be a global partner with other agencies. That is, you've got to look at your cherished mechanisms of funding to see whether, in fact, they are the most appropriate. Are you willing to pool funds with others? Because we don't think that you've done a very, you're not really willing, despite two years of discussions with other agencies. Uh, are you um, willing? to uh, submit to a single um, country evaluation system? And are you willing to submit your own method of, methods of self-evaluation to a much more of a global scrutiny to be able to see whether, you know, how effective and efficient you are? That's the point when I think we can really start the discussion at the country level. Are you going to go and actually start being represented at the country level so that you know this debate can take place at the country level as opposed to in Geneva, which is always a nice place to go to. Yeah. But, yeah, okay, speaking <laughs> of the weekend. But, you know, um, it, it's not the place where the debate should be happening. So, you know, those are my uh, discussions. I totally agree with the, you know, the diagnosis. And we have to do a lot better. But you know, I, I think that there are a lot of issues which the Global Fund, you really have to be able to address before you can go in for the concept of an expansion of a, you know, your, your remit. Well, thank you very much. And as head of the Global Fund uh, Transformation Initiative, I would say we're going to take this back to committee. We expect a report <laughs> out. We expect a report out in 2018, and we'll get back to you. <laughs> so what have we heard today? We've heard 
again, a lot of agreement around the issues, that there does need to be an evolution in the architecture to advance global health, that there does have to be more of the architecture oriented toward the very important principle of country ownership, that there does have to continue to be results-based uh, demands, or I shouldn't say demands imposed on countries, but that the whole system needs to be results-based, and that we have to be as oriented as possible to achieving the biggest bang for the bucks, or the Deutsche Marks, or whatever else. Uh, we've also heard great agreement on the notion of whether we don't like the word health system strengthening or not, health system strengthening, and basically supporting the efforts of a country across the board to have the best possible healthcare delivery system to take into account not just donor funding, but also private sector funding, really marshal all the funding available to move the system forward. And we've also heard common agreement there have to be single monitoring systems. It's time to move past dedicated cars, 450 indicators, et cetera, et cetera. 650, 650 indicators. So common agreement there. Really what this last few minutes hinged on was the question of, I, I would say, can the leopard change its spots or can the elephant turn into a gazelle? Is it really the global fund, uh, is it really the, in the potential of the global fund to transform itself at this point? Or do all these other things that we, they agree are so important, can they be achieved in another way through greater cooperation and integration that, as Julian says, is already happening among global agencies. That really is the question. Uh, I guess that's one we can't decide in a debate. We'll just have to see how that one plays out, if it does, in fact, play out over the next few years. Join me in thanking these two for a terrific discussion, first of all. And we look very much forward to seeing you back at our next debate in this series, not as yet scheduled, but most likely to take place in November. And we'll be getting that information out to you. Again, thanks very much to our two debaters. Thank you all. Great. That was fun. Great. Thanks. Great. Great.